Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you had a great weekend. It is Monday the 7th of September. Uh, before I begin, if you're new to the channel, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We've got videos coming from me every morning and the rest of the team as well over the weekend on different subjects all related to markets. Uh, but yeah, getting stuck into what have we got for this week and uh, before I delve into the calendar, obviously a reminder, it's US markets uh, are closed today for Labor Day, so we can be expecting generally on these types of days lower volume, particularly as we go into the latter part of the day if you're based in the UK and Europe, so this afternoon it could be quite quiet. Um, however, one of the things is if I just jump over to here, is obviously markets are still a little bit, it almost feels um, somewhat apprehensive following the stock decline we had led by US indices and the rotation out of, uh, in particular, some of these big, large mega cap tech names in the US. Uh, and so we continue to keep an eye on this. The the sentiment then somewhat still impeded, I feel, by the uh, that sell-off. And it was the worst week for the Nasdaq since March when we had that initial bout of downside volatility when the initial outbreak of the epidemic was starting with coronavirus. Um, history does tell us, I was looking at a couple of data samples from a macro fund in the US and they were talking about some back testing of data and that historically shows that steep sell-offs often take at least three days to basically wash out the panic sellers. So those who might be just bailing on their positions, particularly in the retail market. Uh, and on that front, what could well accelerate that type of mentality is something you've probably read about quite a lot at the weekend, uh, which is about stock options. And uh, the reason why it's gaining quite a bit of coverage um, at the weekend is because SoftBank Group, the Ch Japanese conglomerate, uh, has apparently bought extremely large positions in contracts tied to these mega cap tech shares, somewhat in step to, from what we've been seeing with this kind of legion of retail traders uh, in the US via apps like Robinhood and, and so on. Uh, this is just a graphic looking at the S&P 500 uh, on the black line and then looking at small trader call buys to open premium spent uh, and you can see here there's just phenomenal rise that we've had uh, of late if anything the fang group of companies so your facebook amazon's apples netflix uh, your googles or alphabets uh, they've surged at one of the fastest clips ever with the lion's share of action being in these bullish calls um, if you're new to all of this, what this basically means, to make it as simple as possible, uh, if you spend some money on bullish calls on shares you own in hopes of forcing the sellers to purchase the same stock as a hedge, uh, an ensuing feedback loop drives everything higher and might well explain why you had that phenomenal run in some of these in particular focused uh, tech names. So the idea here then is, uh, and the reason why I think it's a little early to really call the shots, I think, in regards to trying to just get in long right now or will we see another spillover today? And this sort of thing can happen if markets volumes are down and it's a fairly illiquid situation. Perhaps we get another run historically, as I said, the price patterns do typically tend to show a three day period. Uh, with sizable kind of drawdowns in the market. Uh, but the idea being <laughs> it will these kind of Robin Hood, more retail focused investors get a bit spooked then. A lot of them perhaps just new to the game and, and, and benefiting from the big surge and push that we had, obviously with the continuation of that, what, 11 out of 13 kind of bullish days we had before the uh, the move lower we had Thursday, Friday last week. And do they bail and does that exacerbate then a further contraction in this, this equity market in the short term? Longer term, I still feel um, that the market will find a degree of support lower down. But um, on that note, let's just have a quick look at where those potential levels could be. But I think for the moment today, I'm still a little bit more on the fence to how this might play out uh, at this point. So I'd rather not participate, <laughs> I guess, is uh, my kind of view for the time being. But looking on the daily Continuation here at the NASDAQ. This is obviously that chart we've had up uh, a couple of times and just looking, incorporating the sell-off that we've had yesterday and the NASDAQ future is down about another 150 this morning. Uh, so we're finding a little bit of near-term support and a key area technically around here, 11,283. That encompassed the previous push to the all-time high and an area of uh, multiple resistance and support on the push high we had on the 20th to then uh, accelerate the push higher. 
Uh, we've already broken through that key 21 DMA, of course, at the end of last week, so we trained firmly but below there at the moment. The next kind of area or zone that I'd be keeping an eye on would be around here, which does then uh, in the middle mark the 11,000 level, so 11,058 to 10,939, which was this area of price activity through uh, July and the first half of August when the market had responded to a couple of times. So I think perhaps there yeah, a little bit more room uh, to go in the NASDAQ, but as I've said before, I still feel like uh, more bullish over the medium term on the prospects of where that market goes. Uh, in the S&P, uh, again, just going back to that kind of annotated chart we've had a number of times. Let me just remove my, um, my camera feed so you can see everything more clearly. Um, so the rotation out of some of these mega tech names, but overall the market as a whole under some pressure uh, puts us back down at a very key level. That 3400 does mark the prior top that we had prior to the, the epidemic starting. So this is pre-pandemic phase of when we had the outbreak kind of and uh, outside of mainland China. And so here, I think we're quite a good level. If we push any further down, 33.57, I think, is the next uh, level that I'd be keeping an eye on. Uh, that's close towards the extremity of that low that we printed uh, at the end of last week. Uh, and then any further push lower down, uh, probably around the 32.84, incorporating uh, the peak before some renewed China tension started to come in and around late July, which would also coincide uh, pretty close proximity to... Uh, this DMA that we have here, which is the 50. So, yeah, definitely quite interested to see how things play out today. Uh, could be quite quiet, but, you know, just because it's a holiday and the US aren't in the market, that can often make things a little more volatile to some degree, as I said, just given the, the lack of participation. Uh, so a couple of big orders go through and things can get... Um, exacerbated by those conditions but otherwise elsewhere we're going to walk you through a couple of other things that are going on at the moment if i just turn my camera back on um we're going to talk about the ecb we're going to talk about brexit and we're going to talk about a few other calendar highlights like us cpi inflation data coming at the end of the week as well so uh we're going to push on let's go to what happened overnight in asia talking about uh china exports kept expanding in August while imports fell. So China exports were the third highest on record, in fact, um, as trade has continued to rebound in the country. Uh, exports rose 9.5% against the expectations of 7.5%. Uh, the trade surplus with the US was $34.2 billion. That's the highest since November of 2018. And officials have agreed to create conditions to push the phase one deal forward, according to the China Ministry of Commerce. So all in all, uh, a fairly positive result here and certainly flies in somewhat contrast to the rhetoric we've been hearing the likes of particularly Donald Trump, which as we've discussed many times before, will be trying to frame China in a certain perspective for his benefit for the upcoming US election. But one of the things I saw as well, just on topic with this uh, this is a look at Goldman Sachs. They have basically what they call a US-China relations barometer, which is calculated based on 15 specific equity proxies in areas of trade, tech, capital markets, and geopolitics to gauge equity-implied US-China relations. And basically, this number last week fell from 90 to the new figure of 75. So indicative then that trade relations generally it's not that they're getting better, they just haven't got worse, perhaps, and have come off some of the most elevated levels that we have seen of tensions. If you remember, with the whole tech side of things, the concert situation, things have died down uh, quite a bit. And underlying this, more stabilization in China, and therefore, more follow through of commitment to adhere to the deal and purchase and import of US goods. So at the moment, the trade war side of things, I think, is to monitor, but still relatively calm at this point in time. Um, just moving on then, looking at uh, Brexit, quite a lot of headlines uh, about this this morning and if you look in the currency pairs, cable is underperforming. Uh, we're back down to a 132 handle which is finding some support around its relative S1 uh, in the daily pivots in the futures market. So down 85 is underperforming euro dollar which is down just 20. 
A uh, couple of things to get you up to speed on, actually. Uh, quite a few headlines, of course, coming ahead of the eighth round of Brexit negotiations taking place. Uh, and what's happened here is Boris Johnson uh, has come out uh, over the weekend and apparently today he will tell the European Union that he is willing to walk away rather than compromise in what he sees as the core principles of Brexit. He set a deadline of the 15th of October. Uh, as I'm going to discuss then, uh, I'll give you my take on all of this, but let me just give, give you the details first. So his government is preparing a, to publish a new legislation designed to dilute the legal force of the divorce deal he signed with the EU this year if outstanding issues cannot be resolved on the thorny issues of Northern Ireland. So this is called the Internal Market Bill and it's expected to be published on Wednesday. So this is going to make the EU particularly um, negative going into these talks. Uh, Britain have said, well, this is only being done as a contingency backup. Uh, they still want to try and get a deal, but the fact that they're doing that and being so public about it, obviously this is very um, political uh, tactics being deployed in order to just show their real appetite for walking away from the deal to kind of force Europe to the table and obviously this is going to mean that both parties are going to be a far distance apart as they, they discuss things this week. A um, couple of things on the, on the background uh, and while we do that I'll leave up here uh, the kind of schedule of the, the timeline on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday when these trade talks are happening. This is the agenda and the allotted time frames. So it could be um, useful if you were really being uh, prudent, you could look at this timetable and overlay it then thinking about, well, the, some of the key areas here are fisheries, for example, which they've got roughly about six to eight hours worth of dialogue over the next um, few days to talk about, and that is one of the main stumbling blocks so what are the timings of that and when could you then subsequently expect some potential rumours, tweets from journalists, these types of things that could be disruptive for the pound. So that could be quite an interesting way to approach it if you were going to be uh, super proactive on that front. Um, a couple of things though, what, what are the sticking points and why? So on fisheries, uh, of course, is the main one. The EU is seeking to keep the access its fishermen currently have to the UK waters to protect jobs and coastal communities, while Britain wants reduced access for EU boats and to make it conditional on regular negotiations. Uh, other areas then uh, are things like uh, level playing field, uh, a third area of disagreement is what's described as the governance of any future agreement. Um, you know, One of the main things here, really two, for one, fishing makes up only a tiny part uh, of the economy on both sides. The reason why it's such a major thing here is that it was a big part of the Leave campaign uh, and in order to fulfill that, particularly the political pressure that Boris Johnson has been under uh, given the series of U-turns over the summer which has seen things like the opinion poll uh, last week show that both Conservatives and Labour now are absolutely square in public opinion comparative to the some 25 percentage point gains the Tories had when Obviously, Boris romped to victory in the election uh, back at Christmas last year. Um, if no trade agreement is completed by the end of the year, the UK won't have any formal deal with the EU. And this is obviously the growing risk here of this kind of no deal situation. Um, and to give you an idea, uh, note what, what would be the consequence of no deal in terms of actual trade activity. Well, um, Britain and the UK trade accounted for around 43% of UK exports in 2019. So almost half of all exports from the UK goes to Europe. Uh, and similarly, about 51% of UK imports come from Europe. So hence the reason why it's really critical that a deal gets done of some degree. And obviously in the context um, of the UK economic situation of late, which is we're in a deep, heavy um, contraction and recessionary environment post pandemic and also um, you know we have other uh, kind of tangible risks facing the economy at the moment as well um, such as the elapse of furlough and these other fiscal measures which are due to conclude in the coming weeks and months um, the other thing here and just layering up more um, I, I guess uh, question marks over the the popularity of the government at the moment is uh, the UK have reported just shy of 3,000 new coronavirus cases on Sunday. That's a 64% jump 
from the previous day in the highest level of coronavirus new cases since the end of May. Um, this all comes as well as you'll remember seeing Johnson last week, I think Dominic Rabb was doing the press rounds on, on Sunday, and they're all trying to, to really push forward this get people back to work mentality because of the amount of productivity in, in economic sense that's lost, not by people being productive uh, from working at home, that's not the case, but by going to work, you're obviously utilizing public transport, you're buying your sandwich from pret a manger for example, which have had to cut thousands of jobs lately. So all of these other services around then what, what consumers generally use whilst being active and traveling to the workplace uh, are not happening at the moment. So the government's push to do that comes at this big risk, which is seasonally coming to this point where coronavirus is one of those other major headaches that the government needs to deal with. And we've seen one of the biggest leaps in numbers um, since May 22nd, actually, at the weekend. So something to watch as well. Uh, with the end of furloughs, as I mentioned before, being the other um, factor of threat for the UK economic recovery, 30% uh, of manufacturing uh, companies, they were surveyed, and they said that they plan to cut jobs in the next six months. And so 62% of the 226 employers that were surveyed are pushing and want to request an extension to furlough. And this is something that Piers and I were talking about when we did our live session on NFP. Does Rishi Sunak have any other choice, given the likes of his European counterparts in France and Germany, for example, have extended a lot of these programs out into 2021? Will he inevitably have to follow suit? But that in itself um, is going to be divisive internally, given his need to be more fiscally prudent, given the large... Uh, quantities of debt have been accumulated through a number of the government actions over the last couple of months, comparative to then stopping a short-term tsunami of unemployment figures hitting in the UK uh, when it comes to the end of October of this year. So yeah, much to watch when it comes to um, the UK. The one thing I would say is, um, I, let me just bring up, I did a tweet about this. There was a comment out of UBS and I absolutely agree with their their sentiment and their mentality, which was that basically, uh, not this one here, with the eighth round of Brexit negotiations happening this week, what's my overall take? Uh, well, the UK, again, threatening that they'll walk away rather than compromise, saying that this is a moment of reckoning. Uh, this is just classic, I think, management of public perception to fulfill then the mandate of why this government was elected, which was to deliver Brexit. And so uh, I, I seriously don't think that they would walk away without a deal. I think a lot of this talk about this internal market bill, these are all things to try and force the hand of Europe to come to the table. Do I expect any type of progress between the two parties this week? No. I don't. I think there's more than enough time. We've got more than a month before this uh, self-imposed deadline of October 15th that Boris is going to outlay today. And I think between now and then you might see some movement, but even then I think perhaps it'll even go beyond that point. Uh, the idea being that even though this does need to get ratified across Europe, any type of deal, I think that there's, as we've seen before, there's always more time that can be bought if needed. Um, and that's what we've seen throughout this whole Brexit saga. But that doesn't mean, though, that as we go further down that road, that the overall weighted impact of the implication and, and the necessity to have to price in a no deal does not at some point start to weigh more firmly on the pound, which I think it probably will. All right. The other thing, of course, that people are looking at this week is the ECB. Uh, this is probably one of the major or the major event of the, the week. Uh, this is a quick look at euro dollar and obviously going back to May 18th when the Franco-German proposal for the EU recovery fund came out, the ECB ramped up its stimulus, then in July 21st the EU approved their recovery fund. You know, this has been that really strong over-delivery of stimulus that we've had in the Eurozone, whether it be from the ECB uh, or in the form of national government response or a unified response with the European Recovery Fund. And that really has rocketed the euro higher. Now, one of the things then that has led to is that uh, 
apparently, according to reports in the FT and followed by a number of comments from various different ECB members, uh, particularly Philip Lane, the chief economist of the ECB, who said last week that the euro dollar rate does matter. And that is the first kind of step stone or verbal intervention on behalf of the ECB to kind of control then the run rate strength that we've had of that currency, which then could impede if further strengthens the speed of the economic recovery in the euro area. And so a lot of focus on that, uh, no doubt, when it comes to the ECB. Uh, Christine Lagarde, although on balance, uh, we're not expecting any real action from the ECB this week, but perhaps more rather a readiness uh, to continue to act as and when needed, noting that incoming data will provide a better guide as for future potential policy action. So it's kind of really towing the line, uh, steering the normal course, but that doesn't mean then that most people uh, are of the expectation that at some point the ECB are going to deliver more. Now, what form could this take? Well, as much as this could be a wait-and-see meeting, expectations are growing that the ECB are going to have to start to expand their pandemic emergency purchase program, the PEP. Uh, And there was a survey out of Bloomberg at the end of last week, which I'm sure you saw, but it said that most respondents, so this would be major bank economists, are forecasting PEP increase of $350 billion uh, in December of this year, and then it will be extended going out from its um, due to finish in June all the way out to then the end December of 2021. So at the moment, what does that look like? Well, that would then uh, be another top up on what is now what 1.35 trillion euros worth of support on these measures for the ECB. So, you know, huge monetary responses here. Uh, and then in terms of the other thing to look out for from, from the ECB this week is they get a fresh set of projections. So are they going to alter anything on their inflation and GDP? Well, economists predict the ECB to keep the outlook largely unchanged, but this will be another key area. And then the third area that I'd be looking at when it comes to the ECB um, is really um, following on from the Fed announcement on average inflation targeting are the ECB thinking of anything similar? What's their opinion on what the Fed have done? Uh, and whether or not that would give any hint toward the ECB thinking of doing something themselves in future. Uh, that would be a very smaller point, though, to the other things at play. The biggest subject matter here, I think, is going to be some more colour about the euro and then potential timing around and what would be further policy hints. Now, one thing I want to talk about here on those two points, then, firstly, is the euro And I saw this really excellent uh, chart um, that was shared, and it was talking about Euro spec longs have built up significantly over the summer. Uh, And remember, that is a byproduct then of all of the fundamental catalysts that we've had that have been Euro positive, and all the time the Fed have become even more accommodative with their monetary policy. So that's forced the Euro uh, speculators into long positions to take advantage of that appreciation of the pair. But what's happened then is that given the positioning is quite stretched to be long, then the euro is quite vulnerable to what we call jawboning uh, at this upcoming meeting uh, this week. What that means then is that any further additional Lagarde commentary about concerns about the recent rally in the euro could well see some quite sharp moves lower in the euro currency, given how markets are positioned, uh, which are still quite heavy net long at the moment. So something to just contemplate and keep in mind. The other thing here was about the point about how can they tweak programs? Well, right now, obviously, the talk I just showed you with this graphic was talking about um, extending of the uh, PEP and also um, the timing of how long they'll keep that in play. But there are other things as well. I saw one bank suggesting that it could be that they don't... uh, need to talk about topping up they could another thing to look out for is talk about without touching these parameters the flow of buying now in terms of the usage of these actual bond buying mechanisms um, remember they've kept like an overall package size that's been particularly large but the amount actually being utilized was obviously much more 
heavy in March in the depth of the volatility that was seen in markets rather than now with the relative stability that we've had of late. And so what they could do then is just start to anticipate then if what we have been seeing is further coronavirus pickups, the likes of Spain and France again, is to get ahead of that, they could start accelerating some of the purchases again without actually changing their actual parameters of the ECB uh, bond buying program. Uh, so something to just keep an eye on. All right, final few things to quickly touch upon. Um, in the oil market, uh, a few things. The, the Kingdom's state producer, Saudi Aramco, has come out and reduced its key Arab light grade of crude by a larger than expected amount for shipments to Asia, its main market. It is also lowering pricing for US buyers. Um, so Saudi's reducing oil pricing and assigned demand recovery is struggling. A few other things here. Labor Day in the US typically marks the end of peak summer demand season in the US. Uh, and then the third point, China has also slowed their intake in August, um, according to the latest customs data. And obviously China, uh, the, one of the major importers of Saudi crude. So a couple of negative factors there. And just quickly on the oil chart, one thing I was looking at this morning was quite a key long-term technical level that I think warrants watching quite closely as we go through this session. Uh, let me just remove my... Um, my camera again just for one second so here we've got basically this area which was the 10th of July we had a test on that um, on the 30th and here we are right now this morning we've had a test on it again so 3854 um, is quite a notable level I'd say any break of that um, then the next real technical level on the higher time frames is not really seen as support until we get down to the 37 handle that being the low that we printed on the 25th, and then you can see some respective resistance and support going back into May and June as we were recovering from that price dip that we saw uh, on the pandemic recovery. So yeah, definitely worth keeping an eye here on crude, some key levels um, we're just testing at the moment in the context of some of the more negative headlines that we've had uh, recently. Again, if equity markets do start to fall over again, uh, that could put some downside pressure as well, just generally on sentiment, which could then um, open up um, some some question marks then over the overall global recovery with oil. But I think the two are a little bit disconnected. Uh, I did see one comment, and I think it was quite a good description. I think the equity pullback that we've had at the end of last week is some of the froth coming off the kind of boiling nature of the the extreme rise that we had, particularly in the NASDAQ and the tech sector. So I, I don't think it's too much on that economic narrative. I think it's more profit taking inspired. And so I think there's probably a very loose connection uh, to thinking that there's a, a global tie to then a uh, real renewed panic in the market that would cause some of these assets like equities and oils to move in a correlated fashion. I think they would move quite isolated if anything, but as I said, there's a few there's a key technical level support if that breaks in, in in the context of some of these more negative headlines and then things like covid numbers in mainland europe uk start picking up um then it could be something more meaningful for oil but for the time being covid numbers that i was tracking over the us at the weekend still relatively looking good at the moment in terms of continuing to decline on all measures as we were seeing last week uh, the other final thing just to mention um, was at the end of the week, we do get um, US inflation data. We've got CPI and PCE and US inflation numbers will be in focus somewhat just given the recent um, framework review that concluded in the adoption of average inflation targeting by the Fed. Um, inflation generally has been moving back up, obviously, as uh, the economy in the US has started to reopen. And we're coming off that real floor that we printed a few months ago in the, the midst of the main part of the national lockdown. Uh, and that is expected to somewhat continue. However, how important is this now, particularly just given how low we are away from 2% at the moment, I think perhaps actual in actuality probably less because of the nature now that it's not such a fixed line, that dotted green line in the sand of 2% anymore. There's flexibility for it to go below and above. And so actually, I think it'll be quite a key thing to watch, but perhaps not not a massive deal for markets. Um, and yeah, that, that is pretty much it. Uh, there's obviously other things. Uh, Bank of Canada meet this week, but they're expected to keep rates unchanged. Uh, so not expecting any real policy movement there. 
Um, but yeah, there's a full calendar here that I'll share later with you guys anyway, um, if you need it. But that's it, I'm not gonna go into anything more. So really, ECB is the main focal point. Uh, quite a few things uh, going on, the UK and Brexit talks restarting, uh, but cable is underperforming, uh, and it could well then just continue that theme as the outcome of talks in the eighth round negotiations is likely to conclude in the two sides still being quite far apart, in my opinion. Um, some some heavy nature in terms of price action trading in crude oil overnight um, and then yeah, as the week progresses still a little bit fragile in the US equity sentiment really waiting for the US to come back tomorrow to see the volumes pick up again uh, and see where we go from there but that's it any questions at all feel free to drop a comment happy to help as usual uh, but have a good week ahead thanks very much